Hey everyone. Uh, good morning. Have a it's good to be back and uh, continue from what we've been what we stopped from. Uh, so last week we talked about aspects of corporate vision, mission, and values. And we talked about our core values at APC and some of the things that we believe at APC. So we, we'll continue from where we stopped. I think we stopped with Nehemiah. We were discussing uh, how Nehemiah you know, rounded up a team of people. He had the vision. He had the strategy. He had the mission. And how God enabled him to fulfill that vision, right, of building the walls of Jerusalem and uh, fixing the gates. Uh, all right, so we'll pick up from there uh, at uh, create a culture aligned to your vision and mission. So if you have your notes open, you can go to that point. Let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, get into the class. Uh, maybe one of us can lead in prayer. Any one of us. Yeah, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day and we thank you for the beautiful class we are about to have. God, we just invite your spirit to lead us throughout the session. We pray that uh, as pastor teaches us every single thing, uh, we will open our mind and heart and we will understand the truths in you, in the word that you have given us and we will put it into practice. Lord. We will put it in our practice so that we can uh, help others uh, to be found in you jesus help the lost souls to be saved be with us guide us and help us to understand in jesus name i pray amen 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 thank you Jafina. right so last week we stopped in this right uh, so let me just backtrack a little uh, and how nehemiah he had the vision right and uh, the people of jerusalem uh, he shared his vision with the people uh, and then the vision was compelling. People said, okay, sounds like a plan. So, uh, you know, no, they didn't ask how many people you have under you. Uh, can you, you know, show me a three page write up on how we are going to plan? No, the vision, which was in Nehemiah's heart, was compelling to others, right? And people, was in, people were inspired to join that vision. Second, there was a mission. What was the mission? To reconstruct the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, and there was a way that he did it, right? So he said, okay, whoever stays closest to the wall, whichever section of the wall you are closest to, uh, you go there and do your part of getting the wall uh, fixed, right? Now, there were 10 sections. So there were 10 different uh, leaders. And under them, they had other uh, you know, workers who went about doing their part, portion of the wall. Now, we must remember that these were people who were working, right? They were not like, you know, doing nothing. They were working, but what they did was during their spare time or during their free time, the vision was so strong that they were able to, you know, uh, uh, go ahead and continue uh, building the wall. And then they had values. What was the main value that they stood by? One of the main values was God was on our side. We will work together and nothing can stop us. Right? So, so the values that they carried were very strong. Now, during the course of time, there were ups and downs. If you read the book of Nehemiah, you know, uh, Sanballat and all his other people tried to uh, bring offense, try to stop the construction of the wall. But the values that Nehemiah set helped them during those difficult times. Says, hey, God is on our side. Uh, we all will work and nothing can stop us because God is with us. And the fourth one is culture. So people worked together as a community, as, a, as one strong community. Um, so how did it happen? Nehemiah set the tone shaped and preserved a strong culture of work, support, generosity, and humility. Now, how did he do this? By his own personal example. So it was not like Nehemiah was saying, okay, you do this, you do this, you do this. I'll come back after two days and see your progress. No. Nehemiah was there. Right? He said, hey, we are all, it, it is my vision, but we are all going to work towards it, right? 
So he he built this sense of one community, one unity, one goal to build this wall, right? Uh, and then if you read on, right, uh, he, Nehemiah does so much. There was so much of uh, generosity that he showed towards the people and people themselves, among themselves, were generous to each other. How? Because of his personal example. And this is a powerful sign of a leader. Right? Let's look at a few points there. Everyone worked. So people from all trades, all ages, men, women, the priests, the goldsmiths, the district leaders, the Levites, the gatekeepers. Imagine the priests. Can you picture this? The priests. You know, they're standing there near the wall. They're you know, doing the work there. Now imagine the people of Jerusalem. Oh man, the priests have come here to help build the wall. So imagine the lay people. They'd be like, wow, this position is so strong that even the Levites, the, the ones who are, uh, you know, the high, the rich, the poor, everyone have come with one purpose to build the wall. Right? It's a powerful, uh, powerful uh, picture that we would have seen. Uh, imagine the uh, you know the others who were the Sanballat and uh, the others who were trying to stop the construction, and they're looking at this. Okay, he's, this Nehemiah has rounded up the rich, the poor, men, women, probably children as well, right? Priests and goldsmiths, district leaders, gatekeepers, merchants, common people. All of them are helping build the wall. Now I can only picture maybe a priest could say, hey, I'm not good at this. I don't know how to do this. And, uh, you know, maybe the the common people or the merchants are saying, yeah, I'll show you how to do it. Here's what you do. You you put this, put the cement, you put the brick here, leave it for some time, then you move on to the next. Each other. Why? Because it was one big community. Uh, the, what if the priest had said, uh, who are you to tell me? Oh, I know everything from the scriptures. No, nothing. Right? Uh, there was this sense of unity. Everyone worked. And they worked with all their heart and with all their mind, with everything that they have. Right? Uh, there was no half hearted work. It was not like some of the stones that they were. Now, if you look at uh, in history, how they rebuild the world. It's not like how we have now, right? Uh, neatly layered bricks with exact shapes. They would have just been, you know, uh, big stones or rocks uh, just put together, uh, probably using cement or, uh, you know, uh, the hay and, uh, the, you know, those cement which they make with hay. Uh, and that's what they probably used. No machinery, just hands. Right? Uh, Everyone worked with all their heart, with all their mind. They supported each other. Um, uh, that was a wonderful picture, right? So, uh, uh, Nehemiah 4.16 says, So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at the construction, while other half held the spears and shields with bows and wore armor, and the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. It's just picture this, right? So, Nehemiah's... You know, the, the, the people come and tell Nehemiah, Nehemiah, we have heard that, you know, they're going to come and attack. They're going to stop because now they are fearful that we are, you know, we're continuing on in this building of the wall. They are fearful. They feel that we are going to finish construction and now they're going to come and attack. So you better stop. And so they make some false accusations saying they make a false, this thing saying the king is upset with you because you have... Uh, you know, build the wall, but Nehemiah doesn't believe in all that, right? So what does he say? Okay, if they're going to attack, here's what we're going to do. If we are 1,000 people, 500, I'm just an example, okay, with the numbers, 500 will hold spears and shields and stand right in front of the wall where the construction is happening. So when there's an attack, they'll be able to, you know, uh, uh, fight the attack. Right. And the other 500 will continue building the wall. Now look at the wisdom that Nehemiah dealt with this whole situation. 
right? Half of them are standing guard, the other half are constructing. Probably the next day, the other half are constructing the wall, and the other half are uh, standing guard with armory. Now, you look at this, right? it's so powerful. In leadership, it's not only about you know, uh, achieving things. It's about how you go about achieving those things. Right? Rulers were used, were urged to be generous. Nehemiah said, I have let the people borrow money and grain from me. So have my companions and those who work for me. Now, let's give up all our claims to, to repayment. Cancel all the debts they owe you, money or grain or wine or olive oil, and give them back their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses right now. And here's what the people replied. Nehemiah 10, 5 verse 12. We'll do as you say. We'll give the property back and try and not try to collect the debts. Now, here's what's happening. We must understand that the Jerusalem is in captivity, right? The Jews, the Israelites are taken captive. So people started, you know, uh, the, um, among the Jews, they started, uh, for example, they would say, okay, you take this land, piece of land, you can do what you want, to want with it, but this is what you have to pay me, right? Or you take this uh, belonging that I have, this is what you must pay me, and this is with interest, whatever, right? So during that time, during the building of the wall, Nehemiah says, let us cancel all the debts, right? Now, you may have given a land to somebody. You have may given them, uh, you know, uh, maybe your plantations. You have given them some, uh, you know, maybe gold, silver, whatever you've given them. There are debts among each other, right? Now, since we all are working in one team, let us cancel off each other's debts. Right? It sounds nice, right? But look at the response of the people. We'll do as you say. We'll give the property back and not try to collect debts. You see, Nehemiah's vision was so embedded into the, the, people, the Jews that they were also willing to let go of all of these uh, monetary benefits they were supposed to receive. Even their debts, even the things that people owed them, they said, okay, cancel, debt cancel, cleared, nothing. We're all, because we're all working towards the wall, we're all one team, we have a unity, we all uh, have this one purpose. So forget about all the debts, leave that, let's focus on the wall. And so it was really powerful to see that. Finally, Nehemiah led by example. Nehemiah being a leader and being in the government, working in the uh, king's palace, he refused the rights and benefits of a leader. Nehemiah led by example. Here's what he says, right? Nehemiah 15, sorry, Nehemiah chapter 5, 14 through 16. During all the 12 years that I was governor of the land of Judah, from the 20th year that Artaxerxes was emperor until his 32nd year, neither my relatives nor I ate the food I was entitled to have as a governor. Every governor who had been in office before me had been a burden to the people and had demanded 40 silver coins a day for food and wine. Even their servants oppressed the people. But I acted differently because I honored God. I put all my energy into rebuilding the wall and did not acquire any property. Everyone who worked for me joined in the rebuilding. Right? So Nehemiah being a governor, being in working in the palace, he had definitely had a lot of benefits. And so he says here that the previous governors demanded silver coins, uh, 40 silver coins a day for food and wine. And they also oppressed their servants. 
But here, Nehemiah is saying, I didn't do any of that. I didn't oppress them. I didn't ask for money. I didn't say, okay, you do the work. I'm going to just be here in the temple and monitor the work. No. What did he say? I joined. I put all my energy, all my efforts in rebuilding the wall. And this was why Nehemiah saw success. Right? Nehemiah chapter 6, 15 and 16. After 52 days, of work, the entire wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul. When our enemies in the surrounding nations heard it, they realized they had lost face since everyone knew the work had been done with God's help. Everyone, what the entire wall was built in 52 days, and everyone, all the enemies, saw the enemy saw that it had been done by god's help so when you and i have a vision you and i have a mission and we have certain values and we you know, get together a team and we begin to work on that vision if we do things the right way with the right attitude knowing that we, you know with god on our side our enemies will realize that God is on our side and God has helped him. This is not what uh, the Jews are saying. Right? They realized, they realized, the enemies realized that the wall was built because God was on their side. Because the enemies knew that Nehemiah is no skilled, uh, uh, you know, um, worker, or he's no, he's not skilled in, you know, all this mason work. He's not skilled in all of this. Like he, he's just a cup bearer. And the other people he has in his team were not skilled also. But they did it together, and God was with them. So this is a perfect example of a good culture. Uh, when you create an organization. We have to create a good culture. What we do initially from the beginning is what matters. Of course, over time in an organization, we add new things. Uh, we come up with new ideas, new innovations, new strategies on reaching out and everything that we have to do. But the culture is something that we as leaders set. Now, whether it's ministry, whether it's business, create a culture uh, culture is not just a concept it is what you do it is what you live by uh, one of the one of the cultures that we have in apc is you know it's a simple thing but it's powerful right is after you eat or drink something you use a plate you go wash your own plate and wash your own cup now this was an example set many many years back we do it ourselves it may not be something very biblical or no nothing biblical about it but but it's a culture so as the generations come as the church or as the ministry goes they'll know that, hey this is the culture if we eat something in the plate we have to wash it and keep it right Many a times we we you know we've gone to North India to our conferences and uh, we have all different kinds of pastors meetings and the youth uh, conferences and you know those conferences usually last three to four days and uh, after the lunch break we are so we have we are you know so habitual that we after eating we search for a place to you know go wash the plate right? so like this many a times we've gone we're washing the plate. And the people there are not saying, hey, the pastor's washing the plate. He doesn't have to wash the plate. But it's nothing. It's in our culture. It's embedded in us. It, it, is, it is normal. There's nothing wrong. Right? So these small things can add a value to your organization. Right? Uh, another thing that we, you know, these are just practical things, right? Some of the things is uh, always be open to listen to ideas, to people, right? So the suggestion may come from anyone, but be open to listen. 
it, we, we may not adapt the suggestion or the uh, immediately, but but be open to listen. Everyone's opinion is important. Every single person in the church, every person in the congregation is important. Uh, it doesn't matter you know, how many years you're in the Lord or uh, you've been attending APC for either one year or 15 years. Everyone's opinion is important because we all are one team. So these are certain cultures. Now, it is is a culture that we have, you know, we have from the early days and we try to continue to do this, right? So our culture, a culture of leadership and innovation. We pave the way. Uh, we do what has not been done before. We take ownership. And so sometimes things work, sometimes things don't work, right? So we take uh, ownership, right? Uh, like, you know, this morning we had our uh, uh, Bank City pastors meeting. We start at 7 a.m., right? So we have restarted this after uh, probably about three years. And so today we had, you know, we had the teams there and we had, you know, people who could attend via Zoom. Uh, and it was the first time we were doing this, right? So people could attend by uh, through online as well. So new ideas, you take ownership of those ideas. Yeah? Uh, a culture where people connect, cooperate, and collaborate. We are a team. We work together as a team. When we win, we all win together. Right? If something didn't work, we all take responsibility right? and see how we can improve. A culture of being transparent and honest. We are open and honest in sharing information, ideas, opinions, and learning. Right? Being very transparent. Right? So if I feel that uh, you know, this is something that can be changed within the church, uh, I can definitely go up to my senior uh, leaders and talk to them, and, and uh, it's just my opinion. I'm putting it across, putting it across, and uh, they may not, uh, you know, adopt that uh, opinion, or they may not immediately put it into action. But I have a platform where I can share my thoughts, right? A culture of equality and respect. Uh, this is something that we we really emphasize. God has made all of us equal, so we treat each other equally. We respect everyone. We everyone is equal. Right? It doesn't matter what is our background. It doesn't matter of our language. It doesn't matter uh, whether we are in a city or we've come from a city or come from a rural uh, place or from a village. It doesn't matter everyone are equal in the eyes of God and we respect everyone right uh, then a culture of sharing and caring uh, work is more than a job we do we participate in others lives so one thing that we do is we uh, you know uh, we have life groups we have uh, fellowships we, we just, you know, get into uh, the intricate sharing with each other something that we are planning to start this coming year is mentoring, right, to mentor one another. And then a culture of fun and laughter. So it's it's not only, you know, oh, we're doing ministry, so it's, we should be, you know, always strict and always thinking of, you know, uh, you know there's no laughter. No, we, we do have fun. We do have team outings together. We have team fellowships together. We have church camps. We have uh, so many things that are going on, right? So. Uh, the culture, our culture, will help determine the characteristics of the organization. Right? The culture helps determine the characteristics of an organization. Uh, and so this culture can be set in even in your cell groups, your, even in, uh, in your workplace groups, in your work, in your ministries, in your churches, in your home, in your family, among your children, uh, you know, these cultures can be set in. Because always remember, when you start, we start small, right? And if we don't set those things, those the culture from day one, 
imagine the ministry grows and then you're trying to set in something new not many people are going to adapt it what they'll say is hey for the past five years i've been doing this so this is how i will do it right so we must be willing we must look ahead in, in terms of okay this is what i'm going to do now is going to affect what is going to happen maybe five years from now ten years from now and again the succeeding generations also the culture is there because we're teaching our uh, next generation as well right any questions any thoughts uh, feel free to stop me you can ask questions you can also post it on the chat uh, i'm just going to keep continuing to teach uh, but if you have questions please feel free to stop me right next point history is important capture it and repeat it uh, maybe one of us can read judges chapter 2 verse 7 through 11 can one of us read that please Judges 2, 7 through 11. It's in your uh, it's in your notes. History is important. Capture it, repeat it. Judges chapter 7. Sorry, Judges chapter 2 was 7 through 11. Chapter 2. Um, so the people served the Lord all the days of joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived joshua who had seen all the great works of the lord which he had done for israel now joshua the son of nun the servant of the lord died when he was 110 years old and they buried him within the border of his inheritance at timnath Heris in the mountains of ephraim on the north side of mount gash when all the generation had been gathered to their fathers another generation arose after them who did not know the lord nor the work which he had done for israel is that it or uh pastor you're on mute i believe uh, one more verse. The last verse says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Now, here's yeah. one thing. Thank you so much, Divya. So here's one thing I want to uh, just point out and highlight. It says here, when all the generation had been gathered to their fathers, meaning all the generations had passed on, they died, another generation rose up after them and they did not know the lord and they did not know the work that god did for them right so what is the last verse is then the children of israel did evil in the eyes of the lord and served the Baals. it's it's interesting right to, to read this now i we don't live in the past but we are not to forget the past as well right the lessons we have learned now what is the mistake the people made here is the after after moses after joshua the generation during joshua's time did not teach the next generation about what moses did about the miracles that god did about who god is and what he did for for them so basically they had a new generation coming up they had no clue how great God is, about what he, how he brought them out of Egypt and those wonderful, powerful miracles that he performed. Nobody knew. Why nobody knew? Because nobody told them. Right? And so what did they do? Okay. So nobody, there's no God. Okay, we'll, we'll make the idol of a calf and they serve Baal. Right? We must know history to interpret the present and decide for the future. It's not only the success, but it's also the failure. Uh, you know, I think a couple of semesters before we would, we were doing uh, revivals, visitations and moves of God. And one of the things that really stood out was, you know, leaders whom God used so powerfully, men and women of faith, did great exploits for God's kingdom, yet they failed in their personal lives. 
Now, they did great works. Right? It was as if, you know, they were like 10 of them, were 10 of them together, one person did it. Look at you know, great men and women of God, Charles Spurgeon, William Carey. But there were times they were, they failed in their personal lives. They probably failed as parents, right? And 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 so when we repeat history, it's wonderful to see the success stories, but it's also important to see and learn from their failures so that we don't make the same mistake. And one of the things personally that I have learned is God can use us to do great things for his kingdom, but also remember that God has entrusted a family to us. Right? When we get married, we have children. They are ours. It is our responsibility to look after it. We have no excuse to say, oh, I was busy doing God's work. I was busy doing my own business. Um, to build God's kingdom, or I was busy do, being a missionary. Or uh, we can't give all those excuses. Why? Because they are entrusted to us by God. So we must know that you know, history is good. Uh, every success must help us to move forward. Our lack of progress. Uh, we must look at uh, other ways to do things. Strategize. Chase things. Uh, tell relevant stories at relevant times, right? So, uh, for example, right, uh, uh, some of the things that I personally do is, you know, I, I I keep telling my son, he's seven years old, I keep telling him, you know, when I was small, I was very shy. I wouldn't go on stage uh, because now he sees me every day, every Sunday preaching and, you know, leading worship or so it, it never occurred to him. So when I told him, you know what, uh, when I was small, I was very shy. I never went on stage. I would always you know, go away from stage. I was very quiet. So my son was like, really? But dad, you know, every day you're on stage, every day you're, you know, uh, you're talking from the stage, you're playing the you know, guitar on the stage, you're doing all these things. I said, yeah, but you know, so that time what happened was I was very shy. And uh, you know, I was not confident, but then I began to pray and ask God to make me strong, to make me uh, bold, uh, and to know that you know it's not my own strength, but God gives us the strength to do what we want to do. And you know, I usually ended up with this verse: everything that I try to share, I end up with the verse: "I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me." And so, uh, and so, for, so now He knows that it was not always what it looks like. So I keep telling him that there, you may find challenges in your life, uh, difficulties, but remember that you can do all things through Christ when you surrender it to God and God can change it. Right? Um, uh, somebody who was very shy, never went on stage. Now God is using for every Sunday. So the same way uh, God can use you. Right? God can use, so narrating stories in the, um, at the right time, at the right opportunity, really impact. Right? And it goes on to generation after generation. Always remember to narrate stories in a positive manner. Never narrate a story and say, okay, so, you know, this is what happened, and that's why I'm not like, doing this. No. It is being positive, right? Uh, stories that um, use to instructions. Uh, now, again, another important thing, history should not stop us from taking risks or attempting new things. Right? So maybe in the past we tried something, it didn't work, doesn't mean it's not going to work now. right? It can work, you never know. right? So it should not stop us. Just because we tried something in the past, it didn't work out, doesn't mean it's not going to work out again. Keep trying new things. Uh, and don't keep living in the glories of the past. Uh, yes, those victories, those glories are very important. We need it. Uh, it encourages us, it motivates us, but see where we are today and where we're going to go ahead. Right? That's what we want to see. Right? Past successes must be left behind. We think of it, rejoice, thank God about it. But now we need more things. Uh, the, the best example is the great apostle Paul. What does he say? I forget 
what is in the past, but I strain forward for the things of God. So what's he saying? I mean, look at this. Apostle Paul could have said, hey, I'm done. I'm an old man now. I've done my part. Uh, plenty of local churches have been started. I've written a lot of books, a lot of material. But through the wisdom of God, I've been able to write so much. Uh, I've done so much. I, all the 12 disciples put together, I've done it alone. I've done so much. But Apostle Paul doesn't hang his boots and say, keep talking about what he did in the past. But he says, I press on for the goal which I must reach. Look at that. Look at that mindset. Right? He does not stand on the victories of the past or the glories of the past. But he says, but he does talk about his, the challenges and how he changed, right? How those challenges helped him. He talks about his shipwreck and he was beaten by rods and all of this. And then he ends it up by saying, his grace is sufficient for me, right? So when we talk about the past, uh, we learn from it, but we don't stay on the glories of the past. We want to see what can be done ahead, right? Uh, we must understand how to use history correctly, use it to learn from it, to spur us into action, but never let us, uh, let history uh, hold us captive in any way. Right? Uh, so I hope you're getting what I'm saying, right? It's not like you should not share what happened in the past. It's very good to share, uh, share it in a positive manner, but don't stick on to what, was, what happened in the past. I look at what's ahead. So every time you're talking to some people or, or you're as a leader or in your work and your ministry, don't keep talking about, hey, this is what happened, this is what. But you need to let your team know, hey, this is what God did in our in the past. This is how he worked and he you know blessed us. And so now let's look ahead. What is God going to do for us ahead? Right? Let's let it spur us into action. Now, success stories are invigorating. Share them. Right? Proverbs 25, 25. As cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from, from a far country. Right? Now, when an organization experiences success, share those stories. Celebrate people, celebrate teams, celebrate progress. Uh, let individuals know that they've been, uh, you know, they are, uh, yeah, let them know, let them be recognized, appreciated for the contributions that they have made towards the team. Doing this will inspire them and invigorate them. And again, I, I, I'll share this example. I've written this example here. Uh, you know, when we had joined these, when I joined the workplace, uh, right, uh, very, uh, many, many years ago, and we would have these contests. And I remember we would win all these contests because people would just work so hard during that time. And after the whole contest would be over, we would talk about that. Oh, man. You know, for example, our target was 70. We would reach 120, 130. Our targets would, points would reach you know, way above the door. But when there's no contest, we'd be struggling to meet 70. Right? So many a times, you know, I, I remember my team leaders and managers and the workplace, they say, hey, you remember the time, you know, when, you know, we had nothing, but we worked so hard, we reached targets of double of what we are now doing now, uh, you know, we can do it. If we've done it before, we can do it now. And so you're sharing these stories to invigorate, to inspire. Right? So it could be anything, right? It could be... Uh, workplace it could be in the ministry right uh, uh, it's good to share stories just to help us to you know spur us into action that's what we want to do right uh, so we've come to the end of this chapter um, next week what we'll do is we'll get into chapter five uh, since we have only 10 minutes left uh, uh, I thought we'll start this from next week this chapter uh, competitive uh, advantage and strategy now in this chapter 
we're going to be talking about a little bit of competition right now. We're not going to apply competition to ministry. That is going to be focused mainly on the work. Right? Now, there is good competition, there is healthy competition, there's unhealthy competition in the workplace. Right Now, in uh, ministry, we don't want any kind of competition, not even healthy, unhealthy, nothing. No competition in ministry. Right. So if you're in ministry, don't be, uh, don't get worried and say, hey, what is this? They're talking about competition. No, we are one body. The Lord Jesus says a kingdom divided in itself will not stand. So no, uh, competition is for the workplace. Right. So uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the organization level in terms of the workplace, uh, how healthy competition is good. Uh, compete. We can compete in a fair way, in a clean way. Uh, when we win, it's good. We uh, we celebrate God. Uh, when we fail, it only helps us to learn from our mistakes and rise up again. Right. So next chapter: competitive advantage and strategy. And I'm sure we can translate, you know, some things that we learn in strategy. Uh, we can translate it into ministry. Right. And uh, we need strategies especially in the day and age that we are living in, in, in the, all the uh, oppression and persecution that's happening. We need strategies. And hopefully we can get some ideas and thoughts on this that can help us all in our ministries and in our work. All right, so any questions before we close? Any questions, any thoughts, feel free to share and we can close in prayer. All right, so maybe, yes, if you go ahead. Uh, yeah, just a comment, uh, Pastor Paul. Uh, like, in case of uh, Nehemiah, uh, he was also uh, like, um, uh, if we say, uh, a kind of a good leader, uh, like a leadership example, right? Uh, the things that he, um, especially the uh, values, uh, the value systems like humility, generosity, um, yeah, a lot of strategies that he used over there. Um, yeah, yeah, as you were explaining it, um, really thought uh, that, yeah, it's, he's such a good um, leadership example as well, uh, because we don't see many leaders like that. Uh, yes yeah in our midst but yeah yeah that's really great um yeah also just wanted to share regarding as we're talking about uh, the uh, the uh like uh, you the, there is a culture of washing the plates and all that i was just reminded of uh and uh we had a uh, in in the students ministry we had an ias officer so what he would do is um he would wash his own plates Plus, he would uh, wash the. Uh, he would just, uh, you know, take the plates of the students. You know, he was so humble that uh, he did that. So, uh, one of, uh, so one of my friends, uh, she asked, like, uh, how can you be? Uh, <laughs> how can you do that? Because we were so amazed, like, uh, a person of that uh, stature doing this. So, yeah, I was just reminded of that. Yeah, I just wanted to uh just add thank you thank you thank yes. you so much Divya, for sharing uh, and yeah especially these small things right uh, now we, we don't wash each other's feet and all those that's not required but you know just leading that life of example like what nehemiah did nehemiah he he worked right being a leader he didn't have to do it right so it really shows us such a powerful thing right uh, why did people catch the vision why did they stay with that vision till the end? Because they say, hey, uh, this Nehemiah is telling us what to do and he's sitting in the palace and having grape juice every day. Uh, and we are struggling here, you know, doing all of this thing. Uh, so for them, they are seeing their leader there, putting their, his hands and carrying the rocks. He's a governor. He doesn't have to do it. Uh, so just like leading by example again is a very, very powerful way to, you know, today in our uh, pastor's meeting, we were talking about some of the challenges that we're seeing in uh, in ministry and in church in general, in church, the body of Christ. And one of the points that came up was we don't have examples or models for the next generation to follow. 
uh, and we need to set those examples. We need to set uh, uh, you know, our priorities right uh, for the next generation. And so, yes, it's very powerful. Those three beliefs, you know, God is on our side. We will all work and, you know, nothing can stop us. And of course, Nehemiah had plenty of other values that we can see, you know, uh, and the whole time when he, you know, I love what he did after building the walls, right? He says, Ezra, come. Now, it's not like they, you know, after building the walls, they said, okay, man, work is done. Everyone go back. Uh, my vision is fulfilled. My vision is done. God, you have done it through me. Nothing. What does he say? Ezra, come. Ezra, come forward and read the scriptures. Read what, well, from, uh, read and tell us what God is speaking to us. And you don't see him taking the first, you know, taking the first place there. Yes, it's okay. Ezra is a scribe. Let him read. Nehemiah is not there always in the front saying, you know, I should be there as a leader. I should do it. No. It's okay. So, uh, I really like that aspect. I mean, when you read it, 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 it's just like it sounds like, okay, so what Nehemiah called Ezra. But, you no, know, once the work was done, sometimes during our success, we always want to be in front. Right? Uh, but a great leader will always recognize the others who work in the team. Ezra was part of that team as well. And so it's wonderful. So maybe you can go back in your free time, read this entire portion of Nehemiah from till until he, uh, you know, the wall is built. And uh, you can make your own notes. Uh, you can, you know, just write down things that you learned, things that you can apply uh, in your personal life as well. Right. So can we just close in prayer? And then we'll meet next Monday for our next class. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this session. And thank you, Lord, for your word that we have learned today. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will enable us, empower us, Lord, to, to walk in these values, the culture that you have set for us, God, to know that, Lord, uh, we are your children, Lord, whether we are in the workplace, whether we are in the ministry, whether in family, Lord. Uh, to honor you, to glorify you in everything that we do. We thank you for each and every one of us, especially pray for each and every student of God. May your blessing be upon them, oh God, even as they study and learn from your word. Uh, let the word be like seed sown in good ground, uh, which will bear fruit uh, and multiply for your kingdom. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful week ahead. I'll see you on Monday. God bless you. God bless. Oh, thank you, Pastor. God bless.